Hello. Well, we've been talking about David Hume and David Hume's epistemology over at Lake Minimins. Um, land of David Hume, and a good Scotch place for that matter. Um, what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about the implications of this epistemology on other aspects of David Hume's philosophy, and in particular, the implications that this epistemology has for religion, for the nature of religious ideas, and indeed for metaphysics, for statements about the nature of reality. Now, a little recap. Um, you'll recall that what David Hume did, the way in which his philosophy proceeded epistemologically, as far as theories of knowledge go, was really actually pretty straightforward. He derived a, a, a lot of his thinking about the nature of knowing and operations of the mind from John Locke. But then he went through and he did a, a little observation about um, the way in which we come to know. And he observed, of course, that there were relations of ideas and matters of fact. Relations of ideas, the necessary logical operations of the mind. The things that have to be there in order for the mind to, to think, right? The, the rules, the operations, the basic terms, the, the intellectual grammar, so to speak, that makes all this, this work. And one thing you can say about relations of ideas is that there is a logical rigor and necessity about them. You can't doubt them. If A equals A and you assert A, you know what? You've got A. It's right there. And this works. The problem is nobody cares. And the reason why nobody cares is because this is a, a meaningless statement, quite literally a meaningless statement. It's an empty statement. It's meaningful in the sense that it allows for, for logical operations to occur and the, and, the, and the groundwork for thinking. But there's nothing that's meaningful in the sense of having content to the mind. In order to get to that, in order to fill in this, this logical structure, this logical grammar with, with meaning, we have to go to matters of fact, right? And matters of fact, as Hume talks about it, have to do with propositions of morality or probability, basically fact or value. Um, that these matters of fact come to us, really, or arise within us, in a couple of ways. Uh, we can either have them in terms of immediate sensations, sense perceptions, and that these strike us as in, in, in a very strong sort of way, so that we call them strong perceptions. Saying that my pen is orange, amongst other things, right? This is essentially a strong perception because it's something that we immediately perceive, where the lights are on, right? Immediately perceive, it's right there. I know even that the lights are on, that there's light. Um, these are all strong perceptions. And that's fine. Um, we also have what he calls weak perceptions. These have to do more with, with the internal uh, process of reflection and development of complex ideas in our mind, of uh, the way in which we begin to make these inferences, build ideas up. Like, for instance, it's light in the room, so the light bulbs are on. Uh, the sun will rise tomorrow. I was Seth yesterday. All these sorts of things, these are uh, also matters of fact. They are assertions of both fact and value. But they're based on weak perceptions. They're not things that I immediately perceive uh, for the most part. Rather, I begin to make more and more inferences about them. And, you know, we can get more and more complex so that I can begin to say that the, that the moon is 243,000 miles from the surface of the earth, things like that, uh, as we go forward. Now, um, with both of these, there is a key epistemological point we got to remember, and it is going to come into play within all of this. And that point, of course, is that when we're dealing with matters of fact, while matters of fact are what make the world meaningful, indeed this is where the meaning of our understanding and knowledge and operations of mind occur, all of these, whether they're strong perceptions or weak perceptions, uh, and the ideas that are built out of this, these are incomplete. They're inherently incomplete. Because we always have to come at them from a point of view. And this leads to the great problem of induction, this incompleteness. Because what it ends up meaning, essentially, is as we go through and try to understand the world, as we go through and experience and try to apply the relations of ideas to our experience and deduce and try to make necessary ideas, or put ideas together and have emotional reactions to them. As we do all these things, 
What are we working with? We are working with inherently, inherently limited, incomplete uh, objects to build, to build these concepts out of, right? And we're not aware of it. We're not aware of, we're not aware of it in the sense that we don't know how much we're missing or even if we are missing some part. All we know is that when I perceive something, I always know I'm coming from a certain point of view and that there could be other points of view, though I know not what they are. Because after all, I don't know what I don't know. <laughs> There's that tautology for you right there. Right? I don't know what I don't know. And because I don't know what I don't know, because I'm in this stuck in this position of ignorance and ignorance about my ignorance, and yet I go through and I try to make sense of the world and build more and build more and build more upon it, I'm always in this position where <clears throat> the things that I invest an enormous amount of uh, certainty in, say the power of cause and effect to work in the world, say the persistence of myself as a being in the world, uh, even what I call reality because, because I continue to assert things like existence as being real, all of these things while I certainly have a warrant for them, and, and Hume doesn't think that that's a problem, but the warrant comes from the consistency that I've had in these experiences. And from that, this has to do with me. This has to do with my habits of thinking. It had nothing to do with the objective world out there. And if it doesn't have anything to do with the objective world out there, how am I to make claims about knowledge about them? I can talk about what I'm immediately experiencing. I can talk about how I'm thinking about it. But do I know that? No, I don't. At least I, if I'm honest with myself, I can, I can say this is all I know and I can't proceed any further. Now, how does this begin to fit into uh, philosophy of religion uh, and considerations about the nature of religion and metaphysics? Well, I'll tell you. If you take these insights that Hume has about epistemology, about theories of knowledge, and you are fair about them. You can begin to see that there are all sorts of things that you can claim to know, but you can apply a principle, what we might call, a principle of fallibility to them. You can put yourself in a position where you can begin to test the veracity of these ideas, say, well, it seems like we can go this far, we might have ideas about probability that go beyond this, but we can only speak to this in terms of probability of previous events, and we can be somewhat honest with that. Now, even when we're doing that, when we apply this, uh, this principle of fallibility, say, when we apply the scientific, when we use the scientific method, um, there's still a sense in which we can probably tend to fudge. I think the whole idea of statistics uh, as demonstrating something is probably a kind of fudging with regard to this. The kind of, of warrant and belief that science tells us the way the world is can kind of if, if we take scientific knowledge that way, which we don't necessarily, but if you do, um, this, there's some fudging that goes on here. But, suffice to say, that's a way of knowing that um, it's a way of approaching and thinking about things in the world that allows for a little bit of correction. It's got some built-in safety features epistemologically, is what I'm saying. But there's other things that we would like to say that we know about the world. Yeah, I've got those safety features. And number one amongst them, it would seem, to be consistent with Hume, would be religious ideas. Ideas about God, ideas about belief in the divine, about the very possibility of these things. Because one of the things we'll see with Hume is that when you look at this, when you consider this, when you look at the problems of induction, and then you try to take that, and you try to talk about religious ideas from that, you come to this point of saying, how do you even begin to presume that there could be such a thing as a religious idea? Not just, would I want to believe it, or it's my right to believe it, or anything like that. And it's not a matter of, oh, that's foolish and silly, and you're just being superstitious. It's not just that. There's all that there. But this, you know, we're talking about a philosopher here, and this is, there's a much deeper question at hand. And the deeper question at, at hand is, how is it even possible for the mind to form these concepts. It would seem, as we shall see here, that these proofs of the existence of God, these demonstrations of religious concepts, these are nothing more than illusions generated by the mind, at best. It would
would seem. It doesn't even necessarily mean that they're not there, because we're not in a position to say whether or not they are actually there. But our knowledge got a contradiction in it. Let me go through and explain these arguments. These are all classical little uh, chestnuts from the, from the attic of the philosophy of religion. Um, we'll go through and, and try to talk about some of these arguments for the existence of God, some further evidence for, for the truth of religious concepts, and talk about Hume's critiques of all of them. So, the classical arguments for the existence of God. Well, there are several, and uh, you'll probably, you can find these broken up in all sorts of different ways. But one way to do it is between what are called the rational arguments and the non-rational arguments. And I should say too, when I say this, I'm not saying that the non-rational arguments are irrational. They're not hyperbolic, histrionic people screaming and doing all sorts of things like that, although sometimes they do involve that, I guess. But uh, they, it, it's to say they don't appeal to the operations of reason as their, as their basic um, uh, sustaining principle. They appeal to experience, they appeal to authority, they appeal to feeling, they appeal to something else. Those kinds of things. That's all that means. But with the rational arguments, well we have three classical rational arguments, and there's a lot of variations within these of course, but they, they, they work out this way. The cosmological argument, the design argument, which is it's more or less the same thing as something called the teleological argument, so I'm kind of conflating them together. There are, I suppose, technically some differences, but they basically work the same way. And then finally, the ontological argument. Let me explain what they are, and let me explain then how Hume critiques them. First of all, the cosmological argument. Well, the cosmological argument is an argument that, um, in many ways, I suppose, over the history of philosophy, it probably has the most, the most currency, the most track record. It was originally developed, I suppose, by um, Aristotle, most famously. Um, to some extent, there's, there's ways in which I suppose you could say Plato brings it up in certain places, but Aristotle is probably the most, most famous person for it. Uh, the medieval uh, uh, Islamic thinker of Aroes appeals to it to some extent. St. Thomas Aquinas uses it for uh, an articulation of Christian theology and a defense of a re re bleh, reconciliation of Christian theology with, with uh, classical philosophy. And it works its way through. So it's got a long and long and glorious history, the history of philosophy. But basically the way it works is this. It says, look around you. Consider everything that there is in the world. Everything that there is in the world, insofar as it has some way of operating in the world, has two things you can say that are involved with it. First of all, it, it came into being because there were a set of conditions that brought it into being. And secondly, it's moving, right? It's acting. It's doing something. It's acting upon other things. And I don't mean acting or doing things in the sense it's going out and moving things. I mean, there could be a pan or a glass of water that's simply sitting on a table, but it's still acting in the sense that it's, you know, being a pan on the table or being a glass of water on the table. It's glass of watering, as it were, to butcher the English language a little bit. Um, anyway, it has these conditions to it. And these conditions don't, it seems, come out of nowhere. In order for these conditions to, to come into being, there have to be a previous set of conditions that make those possible. And those conditions, previous conditions, so the designer of the pen or the person who put the pen on the, on the table or whatever, in turn have to have conditions behind them and conditions behind them and conditions behind them. And if we ask, well, what is it that makes it possible for any of these conditions to, to emerge, there has to be some sort of condition that makes all other conditions possible. A first condition, a prime condition, uh, a condition that everything else reduces back towards. And this first condition or prime condition, this is God. Now there's variations on this. Some people will use this to talk about God in the sense of the Big Bang, the creator of the universe, something like that. Classical way to apply it. Uh, another way in uh, is to say, well, the universe, as far as time goes, is eternal, but there's a but there's an underlying condition that makes this causality possible. This is more Aristotle's point of view. The prime mover it wasn't the first first mover, but the most important, the condition for the possibility of motion. These are two variations within this. Suffice to say, rests on cause and effect. Right, everything that is is 
acting and is capable of being what it is and acting in the world because there's a set of conditions that make that possible. Well, from looking at what we've seen with relations of ideas and matters of fact with David Hume, you can see how he's going to line up and take a swing at this one, can't you? Because basically what he's going to do is say, cause and effect, what cause and effect? Where do you get this cause and effect from? This cause and effect, sure, I admit things seem to have a kind of cause and effect. I'm in the habit of thinking about this cause and effect. But I don't know what that has to do with the world. I don't know what that has to do with things that are out there. I just know that has to do with my habits of thinking. That's what I know. Right? In other words, because the cosmological argument moves upon, trades in, and depends upon cause and effect, and cause and effect is something that has to do with a habit of thought and nothing more, as demonstrated by investigating our thinking, according to David Hume, it ain't going to work. So there you go. Second problem, uh, the design argument. This is one that, uh, it, it's interesting, the design argument, sometimes also called the teleological argument for the existence of God, is a, it's a little bit more contemporary. It's one you're probably familiar with. It's interesting because it's gotten quite a bit of currency uh, recently, in particular with the debates around intelligent design and things like that in the United States and school curriculums. Um, but I, uh, most philosophers I know, philosophers of religion, think it's probably one of the weakest arguments. And if you wanted to defend the idea of God, people aren't always sure why exactly you'd want to appeal to it. But so it goes. Um, anyway, the argument runs something like this. It's to say that if you look around at the objects and events of the world, you'll notice that there is an extraordinary amount of intricacy and interdependence in the way that they operate. Consider, for instance, the human body. You know, we've got a human body right here. And this human body, well, it's got flesh, it's got blood, it's got all these different molecules that have fit together in this particular way, and they come together and they establish the possibility of metabolism, and from that, the possibility of consciousness and thinking and doing and giving lectures about David Hume. All sorts of magnificent things like that. And it's a pretty intricate thing that you got going on here. Now, it's so intricate and produces such wonderful and interesting results that you kind of get the idea that it seems like it's designed. Indeed, it seems much more reasonable to think of this as a design rather than something that simply occurred through happenstance or circumstance or just there. And there's a famous example given by a man named Joseph Butler, uh, an older contemporary of David Hume's. I think he's a little older. I can't remember his dates exactly. But um, to this effect, where he, he, he gives a story of saying, imagine that you're walking in a field and you find a watch in the field. Now, there's a possibility that this watch is a random occurrence, that it happened to be raining pieces of metal for some unknown reason, and these pieces of metal came together and fell together, and all of a sudden, there you had a watch. Yeah, sure, maybe, maybe that's what happened. He said, but that's not where your mind's going to go. You're going to look at that and say, hey, that's a watch that belonged to somebody and was designed by somebody. You know why? Because it's just too dang intricate to be anything else. Well, in the same way that the watch is so intricate, so it is that when you look at the world, when you look at the body, when you look at all these different things, design, right? The teleological argument that, that kind of is tacked on to this a little bit is to say that this design in turn also has a purpose to it. That this design is not designed simply to act randomly, but is designed like anything that's designed, is designed with a particular intent. Uh, teleology comes from telos, it means end in Greek, the end that something moves towards. And uh, so there's a, there's a way in which this design also has a purpose to it. So it's a little, it's a little elaboration. It's a flourish upon the design argument. But Hume, of course, is going to take this apart. And he actually does, he, he really kind of goes to town on the design argument in a lot of different ways. Not, not necessarily so much in the inquiry concerning human understanding, but in the dialogues around natural religion, he does it quite a bit. Um, basically, the arguments around this, uh, and he does in inquiry, just not as much as he does in other places, too. The, the argument this, that he brings up are essentially this. He says, okay, first of all, look around at the quote-unquote design of the world. And in particular, consider these design, this design with, with the notion that there's some sort of purpose to the design uh, that it's trying to achieve. Doesn't it seem as though this is a rather 
um, ineffective way of designing this? If we're talking about a designer, are we talking about an immature, an incompetent, or at least a designer who's not omniscient or not omnipotent, the way they, these arguments are, are meant to, to propound, right? This is something that looks, if anything, it looks like this was designed by a committee. I certainly think that probably explains a platypus. <laughs> little joke for you. But, uh, but there's even more than that. There's also uh, the fact, Hume says, and this is really more, of, more central to his argument, the design argument is based on the notion of resemblance, right? It's based on the, on the notion that the world resembles a design. And Hume, again, admits, like Thomas Hobbes, well, there are resemblances to designs in the world. Um, we, might, we might see these. But a resemblance to a design means absolutely nothing. And indeed, the meaning it does have it's just because it resonates with you emotionally. It seems neat, you know? I could, I could, for instance, look at the sky, see clouds passing over me, and see a cloud that resembles a dog, resembles a duck, resembles, I don't know, George Clooney. But it doesn't mean that I can infer from that that tomorrow morning I'm going to be walking and see George Clooney with his dog going duck hunting, right? It would be rather ridiculous to think that. It might be kind of cool to, to have that happen, and it might even give me a certain emotional satisfaction to think, I'm so looking forward to seeing George Clooney duck hunting, or whatever it is. But there's no warrant for that. It has to, it's, not only is it, is it not substantial, the point being, it has to do with me. And of course, it certainly doesn't mean that George Clooney and ducks and dogs are actually in the sky because the clouds happen to resemble them for a certain point in time. So, um, so much for that. Hume actually goes even further on the design argument, but I don't want to. I don't want to waste too much time. Suffice to say that he's he's taken that one apart. And then the last one, the ontological argument. Um, this is one that's actually a little more uh, intriguing in some ways. I think as far as. Hume's approach to it. He doesn't spend a great deal of time talking about it. And it's because the ontological argument is probably, out of all the arguments that you would look at, it's the one that has the least to do with experience at all. It's more of a set of operations of logic. As a matter of fact, we've already seen it in this class. We've seen it in uh, a variation on it in Descartes. Uh, we also, we didn't talk about this, but uh, Gottfried von Leibniz, rationalist sort of going in the tradition of Descartes, also uses the uh, version of the ontological argument. And you might remember, when we were talking about this before, it's an argument that goes, uh, well, I suppose in some ways it, it has its roots in Plato, but it goes, and, and Aristotle, more Plato than Aristotle probably, but it, it's, its main uh, formation was by this 11th century thinker, uh, St. Anselm of Canterbury. And the gist of it is this. It says that when we look around the world, when we consider anything in the world, one of the things we recognize is that there are various degrees of perfection. And these do, by, we talk, by talking about degrees of perfection, we're talking about the criteria by which something can come to be what it is. So we're not talking about what it is, just that in order to be, it must have these criteria of perfection. Um, he goes on further to say that that suggests a hierarchy of perfection. It suggests further that, that, that there is that greater than which than it cannot be conceived, more perfect than which cannot be conceived, uh, a top to this hierarchy, right? And this top to the hierarchy, he will say, is God. The most perfect thing which, of greater than which cannot be conceived, this is God. He then goes on to say, well, the, the part of the nature of perfection is to exist it is more perfect to exist both in the mind and in the world than just in the mind. So that that goes into the definition of perfection. And by virtue of that, we must infer that a most perfect thing exists. And it exists both in the mind and in the world. Uh, this isn't the end of the, the conversation for Anson. It goes through a few different variations with this. Um, uh, that... Uh, where he talks about a, a fool who doubts the possibility of, of God existing and asks, how is it even possible to, to do this? He 
has a conversation with a uh, someone who may or may not be a made-up person named Guanilo, uh, a monk who lives in in Normandy apparently, who he's corresponding with, who says, "Well, what if I'm imagining a perfect island and this may or may not exist? How do I know?" They go back and forth with this, and philosophers have spilt a lot of ink thinking about this, um, uh, and still do today. There's there's uh, uh, Norman Malcolm, a great British philosopher, spent a lot of time talking about this. Um, there's some others. There's, there's a, well, I can't remember his name right off the top of my head, but there's a number of them. Anyway, suffice to say, this is used. Now, how is Hume going to, to work with this? The way that, that, uh, that Hume deals with these ideas is essentially to say a few things. First of all, he sees no correlation between the necessity of perfection existing both in the mind and the world uh, as, as, as sort of the degrees of perfection. There's no reason for that. And even before that, he also is going to, to say, where do ideas of perfection come from? The very meaningfulness of, of, of some degree of perfection is going to depend on what? It's going to depend on relations of ideas. That's how we're going to assemble it. And why, while there may be ways in which we would apply this criteria, just what or how we would apply it, what that could possibly mean, it's going to depend on matters of fact, it's going to fall into all the problems of induction, it's basically going to mean that even if you do develop this idea of a most perfect being, and you would like to assert from your experience of this most perfect being that it must exist in the world and exist in your mind, and that it's the condition for all these things, again, this is all about you. This is all about your habits of thinking. It's all about your habits of thinking without being aware of, of what you're dealing with. I mean, at the end of the day, what you've got here with these rational arguments for the existence of God, the big problem with them for David Hume is this. It's essentially that what we're talking about with these, with these arguments are ideas about God that can't possibly uh, sustain what the, the concept that they're trying to, to defend. They have no access to the concept. And indeed, the concept that they're trying to, to prove, the, tr the concept that they're trying to sort of work towards through reason, they can't get to it because it's not out there. It's in here. It's in your mind. And it's specifically out of habits of the mind that largely have to do with ignorance, that largely has to do with things that we don't know about the world, that largely have to do with habits, superstition, uh, a certain playful logic in which we try to explain things over and over and again, uh, the kind of logic little kids use when they're trying to explain to you how the goblin that's living under the bed really is under the bed, but you just you have to realize that the goblin becomes invisible whenever the mother comes in and looks under the bed to check for it, right? These kinds of things. So, all these problems, all these arguments are problematic because they, they don't and can't have to do with what they claim about an object of God in the world. They have to do with your habits of thinking and the limits of your thinking. And if you thought you had problems here, we got them even more here with the non-rational arguments. Probably because these are more explicitly part of the realm of experience. Uh, the moral argument for the existence of God. Interestingly enough, an argument that Immanuel Kant is going to defend, uh, although for probably for slightly different reasons than Hume would uh, go against the idea and really is going to somewhat attack. The moral argument for the existence of God, I suppose it has sort of two facets to it. The first way in which it's put forward is to say, consider human beings. Um, Consider the way in which they evaluate. The, remember, when we talk about matters of fact, these are um, propositions of morality and probability. Hume's aware of this, that we make these propositions of morality. And one of the, what, what comes from this is, that, is they say, within this sense of morality, if we investigate what it is, the way that it's coherent, so the argument goes, is because we recognize these ironclad truths to the morality that is there. We just hold them as right and that's simply the way it is. Um, and that these, these principles of morality are, are, in some sense, placed there, written upon our hearts, to quote Immanuel Kant. 
um, by virtue of some divine author that makes it possible. So that the moral argument of, for the existence of God is basically to say that we have morality in the world is only possible because there is a design author that makes that possible. What's more, um, it's said, that if we take away this idea of an author for this morality, an authority for this morality, well, you end up with a really nasty situation. What you end up with is people thinking that uh, there's no basis for being moral anymore. After all, if the authority of God is not there to, to impose uh, this moral truth, well then, as Dostoevsky once said, anything is permitted. Now Hume's response to this basically is just to say, no and why? <laughs> um, no, as far as the idea of saying that there's a moral law written in, in one's heart, in the sense that he says, well, I recognize that people do have these moral sensibilities, but if you want to try to find common conditions for this morality, you ain't going to find it. The only thing that you're going to find is a common way in which these mora this morality seems to evolve in terms of our experience, and it has to do with constructions of moving towards pleasure and trying to avoid pain, using reason to, to work with this, and having sort of internal comparisons from this. It is what we philosophers call a somewhat hedonistic philosophy. Not hedonistic in the wine, women, and song, or wine, men, and song, depending on your point of view, uh, but in the sense that it's, it's, it has to do with senses, and particularly with, with dealing with pleasure and pain and issues around, around that. Um, it very much anticipates what a, a later group of philosophers you might be familiar with called the utilitarians who talk about this. Jeremy Bentham, John Stuart Mill, people like that. Um, but suffice to say that morality doesn't come because a divine author inscribed it in one's heart. There's no reason to think that. There's no consistency to that. It doesn't, it, it, just as far as the experience of morality goes, it doesn't appeal to it. It certainly seems to have much more to do with our own experiences about these things. And then Hume comes along and says, what's more, um, to say that if we remove the divine from morality, uh, we or if we remove the divine, we basically undercut morality. We pull the rug out from under it. He says, first of all, that's just wrong. It's not true. It's perfectly possible for an atheist or someone who's just never considered the idea of God to be moral, precisely because of the way morality begins. You don't have to universalize it. You don't have to appeal to some sort of grand religious cosmology. You don't need any of those things. right? All you need is to be able to be aware of what uh, of, of how these moral ideas hold together, and that doesn't require this big, grand, religious sensibility. Secondly, he says, this undermines the autonomy of morality. And what he says is, is he says, look, I'm not saying morality isn't important. It is. It is something that helps us conduct and organize our happiness and, and, uh, and our capacity to be able to get along and, and negotiate with the world in the way that we need to. But the problem is that while that's what it helps us do in some way, um, it puts us in this position, he says, where, where morality is basically about believing in God. And if you're talking about that, morality is just an instrument for you to fall on your knees or kowtow or do whatever it is that you need to do to follow what, for him, amounts to a kind of ignorance and superstition. It's not an enlightened way to conduct oneself. And it's certainly not an enlightened way to consider morality. Morality has a dignity to itself. And if we can accept that, we can appreciate it for what it is. Um, the dogmatic argument, such as it's an argument at all, but there are some, there is some substantiality to it in some way. Basically, this is an idea, I mean, we, you're certainly familiar with this if you've ever been to Sunday school, um, and you see it throughout the whole Judeo-Christian tradition, that Morality, or that, uh, that the idea for, for the divine is admittedly incomprehensible. But the reason that we subscribe to the, this, these religious ideas, these religious practices, uh, this religious way of life, whatever it is that, that we do, and from that the idea of God, is because Jesus loves me, this I know because the Bible tells me so. Right? This is what it, it does. Well... Now this obviously is not, 
you don't have to be David Hume to criticize this philosophically. Um, someone who says, believe it because I tell you so, trust me, is going to be liable to suspicion. But the defense of, of this argument, when it's given, is to say, well, yeah, but you know, we're not talking about real estate here. We're talking about something that, that can't be evaluated, that, that makes absolutely uh, no sense if you try to deal with it immediately. You're talking about something that, if it's traditionally omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, it has all this power, it's the alpha, the omega, all these things. We can't imagine that. So looking for a reason to try to defend that isn't going to work. You, you need uh, dogmatic authority to, to bring you in line with it because your rational mind isn't capable of going with this. You might have heard some version of this before. Well, Hume says, perhaps, perhaps that's the case, and perhaps philosophy is incapable of dealing with this. But if it is the case, two things to keep in mind. Point number one, you've got no idea what you're talking about. I mean, you, and I mean you have no idea. The idea is not there. There's someone who might be describing a particular thing. You could be taking this, but you, and you have an idea of what's being described to you. But you're not talking about God now. You're talking about what that dude up in the cloth up there standing on the, on that, uh, on the podium talking to you from the big book is saying. That's what you're talking about. Uh, and that's not, that's not God. That's custom. That's simply authority. The second thing, and this is where you know, Hume, perhaps because he is a little closer in terms of experience and a man of the world also recognized this, is that this is, a, this is the road to demagoguery. This is the road to, to controlling people. There is a quote uh, from Voltaire, as a matter of fact. I think I might have mentioned when we were talking about Voltaire, but it's, I think it's ap apropos here, certainly. Show me a man whom I can convince to believe in absurdity, and I will show you a man whom I can convince to commit an atrocity. This, this is what you have just waiting for you, really with all of this from Hume's point of view, but especially here. Right? Um, the anthropological argument. The anthropological argument is, it's, it's, that's not a term that Hume uses, but... But it's a, uh, basically the argument that, that every, it's natural for human beings to believe in God. And everywhere one looks, one finds this desire for the divine in the world. And Hume says, you know, this kind of armchair anthropology is, is quite simply wrong. Not everybody believes in God. There are atheists. There are people who have all sorts of different uh, religious ideas about the world. Uh, there are there are polytheists. There are if you take something like Theravada Buddhism, uh, there is a way in which one doesn't consider the transcendent at all. One considers the immediate the immediate situation of the four noble truths and how is it that one deals with the problem of suffering with regard to this. Um, there, if, if you go to, it's interesting if you consider Confucianism a religion. You go to Beijing. You go to the old Temple of Heaven, the the, the Ming and the Qing dynasties. Um, uh, forbidden City, and in the middle of that, the Temple of Heaven. Um, one of the things that you find within that is a temple that was built to no gods. It was simply to the nature of rituals. Right? So, the anthropological argument doesn't work because it's just wrong. Not everybody feels the way you do if you're a religious person. And Hume's saying this without really even knowing much about the Asian traditions. What he calls religion, as you can see, is primarily the monotheistic religions, the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and by inference, something about Islam. He does seem to know about a few other things. He knows about some of the animistic religions of, of um, earlier peoples, polytheisms. He seems to know a little about Manichaeism, sort of the good and the bad forces at work. He mentions these things a little. And it's possible, I suppose, that he might have known about Asian religions. Uh, some of his contemporaries did. It wasn't utterly unknown in his time. But he never makes any mention of it. So he doesn't even, he's, he's saying this and recognizing this even without reference to them, which is very good evidence. And then finally, you have the mystical argument. And the mystical argument is, to some extent, one knows that God exists because one has this transcendent experience of the divine in some way that affirms this truth. A, a sense in which you can feel the presence of the entire universe in an inexplicable way 
immediately before one, and that it's a non-rational idea that 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 makes itself utterly aware in our consciousness. If you're actually ever interested in reading something about this, there's a philosopher named Rudolf Otto, O-T-T-O, -T -O, wrote a book called The Idea of the Holy. He doesn't call it the argument for mystical experience, but he talks about the non-rational dimensions of the idea of the holy. Fascinating read. It's a very, very good book. Um, but anyway, what Hume will say about that is he'll say, again, something, something of what he'll say about the dogmatic argument, although with a little bit less vigor to it. Essentially what he'll say is that, uh, well, that, you know, perhaps, perhaps this did occur. Perhaps the divine made itself present and infused a sense of consciousness of it in you in such a fashion that you cannot describe because it's beyond the limits of experience and you can't contain it in your mind and you can't go back to it, you only remember having the experience. All these different things. Fine. But what concept are we talking about? What could this possibly have to do with? How can this relate to anything that we know? It's disattached from anything else in the world, right? So that the qualifications have become meaningless. And what's more, Hume says, um, it, it really is meaningless to the degree that if we continue to hold on to it, as with the dogmatic argument, there's a certain way in which we use it to feed into our ideas about religion not because these ideas are warranted, but because, essentially, they feel good. They, they feed into certain psychological needs for security, sometimes for ways to intimidate or dominate other people, something we've clearly seen with, with religion before. Um, ways to, to expand, explain or placate certain inconsistencies in our knowing. It works with regard to all these things. This is what it does, but it's not it's not actual knowledge, and it's certainly not arguments for the existence of God. Again, what do we see with all of these arguments? Fundamentally, what we see is none of them, whether you're talking about the rational arguments or you're talking about these arguments from experience, none of them, none of them have to do with what they claim to have to do with. None of them have to do with a God that is out there. They have to do with an ignorance that's in here, that's trying to put something together, infer it, for psychological reasons, right? And finally, this is what occurs. You might say, well, okay, fine. I don't know that I can ever know anything about God. Maybe nobody can ever know anything about God, even on the dogmatic or mystical levels. But you know what? I believe in miracles. Quote a great song from long ago. Um, maybe you can say that. Or maybe you can say, yeah, and I have, but I have a sense of the soul or I've had these experiences with this. Well, again, let's take Hume's epistemology. Let's take his matters of fact and let's think about what, what comes down with this. The first thing is, with regard to miracles, Hume goes through, in chapter, this is in chapter 10 of the inquiry, um, and he, he gives a, a, a whole series of reasons just in terms of practical experience, of ways in which we accept, try to make sense out of the physical world, that, um, that miracles seem unreasonable. He talks about the fact, well, you know, there's all sorts of things that were considered miraculous a long time ago that clearly aren't miraculous now. I'll bet if you turned around this YouTube video and you showed it to a caveman, he would start worshipping it because he would think it was a miraculous thing. But you know what? It's not. Right? Just because we don't understand something right now doesn't mean that it's a miracle. And Hume, and a, you know, and a miracle, of course, being the idea that something goes against the laws of nature and is caused by divine will. Just because something can't be explained right now doesn't mean that it's, that it's a miracle. And he says, as a matter of fact, the first thing you'd have to do if you wanted something to be miraculous, you'd have to go through, you would have to talk to every single human being who ever knew anything ever or does know anything at all or who will know anything in your time machine, which apparently isn't miraculous either, go through, ask them, and find out whether or not it violates these laws. Second thing, right, so you, that's the first thing you have to do. Second thing you've got to do, you'd have to take into account what I like to call the problem of the telephone game. Not a term Hume uses, of course, but basically it's, you know, the, the game that children play sometimes where they take, take an idea, they whisper it, they sit in a circle, they take an idea, one whispers it to the second person, whispers it to the third person, the third to the fourth, the fourth to the fifth, it goes around, and by the time the message has gotten around the circle, the original message seems to be utterly corrupted. 
Well, this is, doesn't just happen with small children playing games. This is something that occurs um, all the time when you're dealing with, with texts and scriptures. You know, you think about the way in which religious ideas are transmitted. Just think about Christianity. You're talking about a series of, of, of scriptures written by, just in turn, and this is just with the New Testament, just with the Christian Testament, not even the Hebrew Bible. Um, a series of, of letters that were, uh, and oral reports, that were written over, you know, hundreds of years, literally, uh, that go through a series of, of all sorts of additions and re-editions that have been taken out, you know, taken out of that edition, put back edition, gone through, through different uh, revisions, been uh, edited in all these different ways, been thrown out, been condemned as heresy, brought back in, all sorts of stuff that goes on with it, with these. I am being a little bit general with all of this, but suffice to say. This is the, the process. If you look at what, what occurs between about the year, I don't know, the, the first quarter of the first century common era and the formation of the, the first formation of the Bible that we have, which is probably sometime at least in the middle of the second century, you have all sorts of things that are going on. And when you, by the time you actually begin to get orthodoxy with the Council of Nicaea in uh, the first half of the of the fourth century, I mean, you've been already been through a bunch of different translations of, of these ideas, a bunch of different committees, a bunch of different revisions. Even today, we still find gospels hidden in caves in Ethiopia, you know, um, or in Egypt, that uh, that contain all sorts of hidden, mystical, usually Gnostic statements about about God. Why do we find them? Well, because they were basically they're on the cutting room floor. That's what they amount to. Suffice to say that when you're talking about reports of miracles, reports of really any religious idea, but most notably miracles, you have to keep in mind the message itself has gone through all sorts of corruption. There's a third thing that, that Hume brings up with this, that, that you think about one of the things that occurs with miracles, is miracles usually exist for the sake of um, uh, impressing relatively ignorant people, uh, at least initially, to some particular purpose, and um, or even if they weren't ignorant, it's for impressing them for some purpose. And he says, given that that's the case, you ought to immediately be suspicious. If something is, if God does this in order to prove a particular point, one wonders why it is that God's going through this, given what we've seen already with all of this, of the perniciousness and demagoguery and that is so easy to cultivate in sort of religious ideas. And then finally, the last uh, point he brings up is he says, take, take and keep in mind what you have with, as far as the exclusive claims of, of miracles go. He says, you know, if, if the miracle is being performed by God and the one true God, and every single claim to a miracle is being performed by the one true God, you got a logical problem. At best, only the miracles that, that appeal to, to this one particular God, Yahweh, Elohim, Elvis, whoever, are in fact going to be legitimate, right? In other words, at best, only one of them, one of these, this collection of claims, or a group of this collection of claims is going to be right. And very possibly, none of them are right. And that doesn't have to do with experience. That's relations of ideas. That's just logic, as far as the way in which the terms work. So, you have all of that. Now, that in itself doesn't mean miracles are impossible. It could be the case that if you did talk to every human being, it would go against these natural laws. It could be the case that the transmission wasn't corrupt. It was entirely clear. It could, it could be the case that no one was trying to, to influence anybody, and it could be the case that this, that this one seems to be consistent. All of that's there. You still got the problem of cause and effect. You still got the problem that you had with all of this stuff, right? That there wasn't any way to really get to these, to, to these ideas. The last one, the immortality of the soul, we've already seen that to some extent with when we talked about the self. Hume, Hume says, you know, I don't really know what this self is, ultimately, other than a bundle of sensations, and I'm saying that because I don't know exactly what it is that I would experience with regard to these things. This is, this is what I have evidence of with regard to this. Um, what's more, he says, as far as cause and effect goes, even if there was something called a soul, which I don't have any idea of what it is other than this bundle of sensations, I don't know why it should have any connection or what its connection with the body should be. That's not explained to me at all. 
So, why should I suppose that there's an immortality of a soul? Why should I suppose that there's miracles? Why should I suppose that there's any quote-unquote evidence empirically for any of these religious claims that are being made? There is no reason for David Hume except for the fact that we are in the habit of making these associations. And in the case of religious ideas, we're in the habit of making these associations largely for the purposes of mollifying ourselves. Now, two last things I want to say here quickly um, with regard to this. The first is that this, the, these critiques, while they're applied towards religion, extend really, if you, if you take them one step further, even beyond religion to metaphysics generally. Because they have to do, um, they have to do with our ability, the reason why all these critiques work as they do, is because they have to do with, our, with how limited the mind is in terms of making claims about the nature of reality beyond its own parameters. Hume is really, when you think about it, a very, very humble thinker. A lot of people don't feel that way. They actually have a very emotional reaction, especially when they see this stuff, you know. Uh, how dare you say this about my religion and my beliefs, and I can believe what I want, and you're just telling me what I can't do, and trying to be clever and do these things. People have that reaction. But think about what Hume's doing. He's not, he, you know, he's not trying to poke you. He's not, uh, um, he's not trying to, and he's certainly not trying to provoke you exactly. He's only pointing out the way that the mind comes to know things, right? This is, this is, this is what this is. And what it seems is, the mind is incapable of making general metaphysical claims. That's why ideas about God don't work, that's why ideas about religion don't seem to work, and why we need to be suspicious of them, because people will use them for our basest functions. In this sense, he's, he has that enlightenment ideal that you see with regard to Voltaire. And this brings me to the very last point I want to make. Really, it's more of a, 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 almost a request, I guess, for you with this which is take Hume seriously. Take these critiques seriously. Really consider them, be fair to them, be charitable to them. It is very easy, if you are a religious person, or if you have um, sense, uh, sympathy to religion, to just cut this stuff off. To, to say, well, he just doesn't like religion, and he's got an attitude, especially in the climate that we have today around religion. The 21st century is firing up again. But this isn't what Hume's doing. He's only talking about what it is to know and how far this knowledge can extend. And if you pay attention to that and think about what the critiques are, um, it gives you, I think, amongst other things, a great deal of insight about the nature of religious experience generally, not amongst anything else. I'm not saying that he's right, uh, either, and many philosophers would disagree with it, but it, even if he's wrong, it's still, or if he's not exactly wrong, mistaken as his own limits, which he himself would admit in his epistemology, uh, there's still a tremendous, a tremendous amount of insight about the nature of religious ideas and metaphysics generally coming from this. It's from this, the critiques of metaphysics, that we move on to our next thinker, Immanuel Kant.